we're here today to talk about the benefits of using conductive plastics. And one of the things we want to talk about is more specifically is lightweighting. What do we mean by that? So most plastics will weigh about as half as much as aluminum and uh, as low as about 20% of the density of steel. So the density range is about 1.3 to 1.4 grams per cc for most conductive plastics. Uh, aluminum is about 2.7 grams per cc and stainless steel can be upwards of seven grams. So when we talk about lightweighting, it's a, it's a huge, tremendous benefit. Um, elimination of hardware. There's a lot of things you can do when you design these plastic parts <laughs> strategically. So you can add features like snap fit uh, mating surfaces that'll give a permanent sealed part without having mechanical fasteners like bolts and screws, which add weight. Um, snap fit housings can be not only a reduction in cost from the permanent removal of hardware, but also reduction in total assembly time, reduction in weight, uh, leading to an overall reduction in complexity, which is, you know, the, the ultimate goal there. Um, the other thing is you can eliminate a lot of the secondary operations, such as machining of die-cast housings to, you know, achieve tighter tolerances. You can replace machine holes with thread-forming screws. Um, and you can also uh, mold with no machining for really high tolerance fits uh, when it comes to under an inch diameter. Type, uh, type designs. So building off of that a little bit, um, instead of machining several parts, the nice thing about plastics is that you can mold a single complex geometry um, in a single go. Um, so what that means is that the, the tools can include very thin walls that would typically require hours of machining or several sheet metal parts. Um, additionally, tolerance control with conductive plastics or plastics in general is on par with the highest of machine parts. So you're looking at tolerances of one to two thousandths and actually far more accurate than what you would see with die cast and sheet metal parts. Um, additionally, the, while the tools for, for plastic parts um, may have an upfront cost, they're going to last nearly 10 times longer, um, yielding upwards of a million parts before scheduled maintenance instead of in the tens of thousands with things like die cast. Yeah, and we realize that, you know, not everyone on this call is going to be designing parts that are, you know, millions of parts. It might be the thousands. Um, so you can actually get away with designing like a modern aluminum tooling with some hard coats that you can use for low volume production, you know, in the, t in the thousands of parts. So you can kind of get away with, uh, with that. So let's talk a little bit about why conductive plastic should be used. Um, there's a long list of benefits that goes beyond just the basic benefits of metal to plastic conversion. Um, so as opposed to metal based housings or plated plastic housings, conductive plastics actually include an absorptive property that reduce the amount of EMI energy transmitted throughout the housing. Um, additionally, you're looking at the fact that conductive plastics can withstand a lot of repeated drop testing and impact testing without damage. So the other thing is you can, you know, eliminate things like, uh, if, say you're going to mold a plastic part. So I had a customer once that had a two-part clamshell design. It was a non-conductive plastic. They were coating it with a, a conductive copper paint. And they were getting a lot of resonance and, and bounce back from the signals inside. So they actually got some pellet samples, molded a conductive plastic part, and because of the absorption properties, um, they they reduced the steps um, in, their, in their design. So they eliminated the masking, they eliminated a secondary absorber pads. Um, there's also a lot of dimensional benefits to, to uh, conductive plastics. So the goal is always to get closer to a shoot and ship part. You wanna get there to zero defect manufacturing. So you can do that through process monitoring where you establish the, the um, the molding parameters. Um, you can get very consistent part-to-part -part results. Um, you can also minimize variation from shot to shot, dialing in those process parameters. You know, when you think of a machined tolerance on a diameter of say 12 millimeters or like a half inch hole, you can actually get plastic parts to vary by less than 10 microns on small parts like that. And you know, this isn't utopia. This is just good upfront planning. Um, and then also conductive plastics come in a variety of materials that can be meant for chemical resistance, um, resisting harsh environments. As we know, corrosion is a huge, 
huge issue. Um, we'll talk about it a little later, but this was one of, this is the only material tested uh, that showed zero corrosion uh, with a specific customer that we'll talk about later. So talking a little bit more about really what the secret sauce is to our conductive plastics. Um, and while we're going to mention it a few times throughout this presentation, uh, the Comeric's trade name for conductive plastics is known as Premier. Um, so when most companies talk about using conductive plastics, um, what they use is actually a non-homogenous blend of pure plastic pellets with uh, metallic conductive slugs. The problem with this process is that it can actually include a lot of inconsistency in the molding process and inconsistent electrical and physical properties of the, the complete part. Um, Premier pellets, on the other hand, actually use a, a long fiber, fiber protrusion process. Um, and so what that means is that you have a conductive fiber running through every single pellet in addition to a proprietary dispersion agent. Um, so what you're getting with that is actually optimal electrical properties and consistent parts from batch to batch across thousands of parts. Okay, so Ben, what is the specific materials used and why does the protrusion process matter? Yeah, it's a good question, Sierra. Um, so we use a nickel plated carbon fiber, as you can see here on the slide. Um, and the protrusion process actually leads to a uniform fiber dispersion throughout the part. Um, so because each pellet not only has the same amount of fiber, but it's actually the same size, um, all the final parts will have a very consistent conductive composition. Um, and here is just a little bit more about what I was talking about. So on the left, you see um, our premier plastic pellets that have that fiber running through the middle, whereas on the right, you'll see a multi-pellet blend. Um, and so you'll see that there's different sizes of the plastics, um, as well as the inconsistent mix of some of the, uh, the metal slugs. And some people in plastics call the multi-pellet blends, they call them... Um cube blends or they call them salt and pepper blends. So you'll hear those terms used quite often. And, you know, they'll get you some kind of decent results for the most part. But the problem with this type of blend is the fact that you can never guarantee a 100% perfect mix. There's always going to be some settling and some inconsistency of the conductive material to the non-conductive material. Exactly. So in the process of things like um, tra transporting the material, a lot of the times the metal slugs will actually vibrate and fall, sink to the bottom of the packaging. Um, and at that point, you know, early shots might have a much higher um, metal composition than, than later parts. Okay, so we get right into the sweet spot in conductive plastic design. So there's a couple uh, things to consider. Conductive plastics work very well when they're designed in the sweet spot, the geometry, the molding parameters. Um, but keep in mind, parts should have a 1.5 to 3 millimeter wall thickness. Um, ideally, it, they have to be consistent walls. You don't want, you know, different thickness walls. Obviously, that's a, just a, a regular plastic molding um, uh, thing anyway. But and you also don't want the part to be too much larger than 150 grams. So the larger the, the part, the lower the cost performance. Uh, it's just a, it's one of the sweet spots. And while there is some upfront cost in, in buying an injection mold, there are a lot of volume-based benefits for programs that require higher volumes. So for example, working with an injection molding partner is actually the best course of action, especially um, with those partners who often work with engineered polymers. Um, and depending on the volume and complexity of those parts, Comerics can, can be a partner. So not only do we manufacture the conductive pellets, but we can also do the molding in-house. Yeah, and so, you know, you're going to see a uh, diminished properties at lower temperatures below negative 20 C. Um, there's also limits to outgassing, but this isn't um, specific to conductive plastics from Comerics. This is a, across the board, you know, so, so there will be limits to that. And finally, the last little point to point out on the, uh, on the sweet spots of conductive plastic design um, is that we actually don't recommend molding a bulk sheet um, or machining pieces of conductive plastics. And that has to do with the variation in fiber direction once you start machining the parts. Yeah, you want to make sure that the fiber, the conductive fiber is always parallel to your wall thickness. And if you're molding a block and then you start hogging out that block, you just can't guarantee that. And as soon as the fiber is perpendicular to the wall thickness, you start losing shielding effectiveness. So we definitely don't recommend that. 
So finally, we're gonna we're gonna go through the best uses of conductive plastics in a, in a summary of what we've talked about, and then get into some of your questions. So the first one that we've mentioned several times is obviously that that weight reduction. So if you have the opportunity to reduce weight by more than 50%, 60% by transitioning from a metal to a plastic, conductive plastics is really an opportunity that you should take a look at. Yeah, next would be part size. So if you have the, if your part is less than 150 grams, if you have thin walls, you know, this is an ideal candidate um, to shield and uh, lightweight. Uh, the next ideal application or, or the benefit is the minimizing of secondary operations. So minimizing machining, minimizing some of those, um, the hardware and fasteners that go into it through things like snap fit and, um, and complex geometry design. Yeah, and, and we've talked about high volume consistency and, and I'll say any consistency really, it doesn't have to be high volume, but you know, the, the ultimate goal is to get to shoot and ship. So, you know, machining, um, die casting, you know, those all, I, I think plastic molding is just an excellent solution for consistency. Another benefit, depending on the different polymer bases that you're looking at, um, would be impact and environmental resistance. So super tough material that can be dropped from 20, 30 feet, as well as materials that can withstand automotive fluids, um, environmental uh, changes in temperature, um, as well as harsher cleaners and chemicals. And of course, high frequency EMI absorption, that's what you know we're here for, that's what Comerics does, is we shield devices with materials. And so, like I talked about, this material actually absorbs the incident energy it also absorbs you know, the RF energy and it reflects as well. So it's a very good shielding material and reduces and eliminates absorber pads, which is just one more thing you gotta think about.